over to you. Suggested this wonderful speaker and knows some things about her that are not necessarily garden related. Uh, our speaker today, George at Talented. Uh, I met first at a poetry event, and she's a very talented poet. We sat at a table together. Our friendship got inter interrupted by COVID, but I became a friend of Georgette's on Facebook, and she started posting the most amazing pictures of her garden vegetables and natives and then her bluebird boxes and all these wonderful things and in the fall she posted a little picture of her giving a talk on butterflies and i thought wow that sounds like something we would enjoy so georgia Callington, i did not know until this biography came in the mail what a background she has in gardening. She is a lifetime member of the California Garden Clubs, served as Diablo Foothill District Director in the 1990s, native plants, study habitat, ornamental horticulture, garden and flora design continue to be sources of study, admiration, and joy in her life. Through the years, her passion for plants and nature has evolved to the study of birds, butterflies, bees, and all things that fill an ecosystem and plant community. She believes in biodiversity as the key to the survival of all life. Georgette has been a gardener for 55 years. You wouldn't know it by looking at her. She looks a lot. <laughs> And she's been a gardener in the Bay Area and a naturalist for 35 years. She earned a certificate of horticulture from Diablo Valley College in 2010 and a certificate from UC Davis Naturalist Program in 2017. She is the State Assistant Program Director for the California Bluebird Recovery Program. And if you're very lucky and you get a message from her, she will sign it, Bluebird Blessings. Yeah. Uh, she has been monitoring uh, net boxes for 25 seasons. Currently, she has a garden lot at Rossmark and is in charge of three butterfly gardens that are in progress. George lives in Rossmore Walnut Creek with her husband, Bruce. And her two amazing cats, Raina and Hermie. And if you get on our Facebook page, you get to be you get to follow Raina and Hermie. <laughs> it is my great privilege to introduce my friend, Georgette Hamilton. Yeah. You guys are so lucky to have Louise with you. She is a beautiful, radiant human being. I follow her on her Facebook page. She's a dancer. She's an adventurous, 180% in everything she does. Um, so thank you for that introduction, dear Louise. And thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I love garden clubs. I was uh, very involved uh, with uh, uh, California Garden Clubs back in the uh, early 90s, late 80s. I started out with the Lafayette Garden Club, which is uh, the Diablo Foothills Garden Club District, and worked my way through in the years and became district director. And uh, we had nine clubs, three fabulous flower societies, roses, Camellias and Iris. And uh, Iris, you know, they're it's not that they're dead or anything, they're still in our gardens, but the flower societies have changed. We all adore our roses and camellias. Um, I think you each have a flyer, hopefully. And I, I you know, a, a handout. 
And I took I took care to put these together um, because they do have some very valuable resources here for you. And I know gardeners, how many gardeners here see butterflies in their gardens? Okay. So I knew I knew that was gonna because I know gar I know garden clubs. You guys are the experts. One of the things I love about garden clubs is how we all share our seeds, our plants, our knowledge, our expertise. And so some of the stuff that I'm gonna go over today, you're already aware, well aware of, but you might get some tidbits to, to support what you already know. Um, so the first part of uh, the first page is a summary of my PowerPoint. I have some recommended books. Um, are you familiar with Doug Ptolemy? Okay, so I have, two of the, I have two of his books. Oh, I actually don't have all of his books. Okay, so that Gardening for Butterflies, Xerxes, Xerxes books. I think that these are some of the best books for uh, gardening uh, for butterflies. And there's National Wildlife Federation. Um, I have a, uh, a wonderful uh, guide here for butterflies and moths. And one of the things that I wanted to bring up today, I didn't cover moths today because I, I, I know we wanted to focus on butterflies and moths are primarily nocturnal, but we need to include moths in our gardens and they are so often overlooked. So, um, and then websites and YouTube videos, I know you guys are familiar with Xerxes, Calscape. How many of you use Calscape? Okay, some of you do, but then some of you don't. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Calscape and that, that will you know, support uh, some of you who don't use it. And then of course, California Native Plant Society, bringing back the natives tour. You guys are probably all familiar with that or some of you are first uh, weekend of May, Kathy Kramer. Fabulous, um, fabulous tour, um, especially you know if you want to see natives and design. Um, and then uh, for those of you who uh, would rather have listen to Doug Ptolemy, here's uh, Nature's Best Hope, a, a YouTube video. He's, he has great YouTube videos. And then uh, a colleague of mine whose garden in Moraga was on the uh, bringing back the natives tour for 15 or 16 seasons. His name is Al Kai. He has one of the most beautiful native gardens uh, that I've ever seen. It is in Moraga. He has been, uh, he's a retired uh, UC Berkeley professor, and he has been gardening with natives uh, since the 1970s. And uh, so what we did with uh, Al, he's in his late 80s now, and we made a series of uh, YouTube videos called Dimensions of Beauty, and they're 10 minutes each. And what they do is they highlight his garden every two months of the year. And this, these are posted on uh, Kathy Kramer's uh, website, but you can also look at them uh, individually on uh, as a YouTube uh, uh, series. And then I have some native nurseries listed there, and I'm sure you've probably seen all those. Um, there's a, a handout about milkweed, um, advising us not to plant tropical milkweed. And then um, favorite butterfly and bee plants by Al Kite. And, and then when we're planting for butterflies, it's very important that we have spring, summer, fall, early winter flowers for them. We wanna have flowers throughout the season. So I also have some suggestions for those that it's not comprehensive. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, well, I'm not going anywhere, Chris. I just click on the screen. Screen, okay, okay. Okay, so why are butterflies called butterflies? I thought you might be interested in a little etymology. Old Dutch was a set of dialects spoken during the early Middle Ages from around the 6th through the 9th centuries. The word butterfly may derive from a word, sheets, 
which in English translates to butter poop. They're, yeah, right. That's what I said. I said butter poop. Their droppings are the color of butter. There is evidence of 15 different spellings of the word before the modern English spelling of butterfly. So it's it's really good to um, to know a little bit about classification. Classification is important because it groups similar animals, insects together so that they can be studied and understood easier. So Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, are in the kingdom of Animalia, of which there are probably more than 9 million species of animals on the earth. The phylum is Arthropoda, which is insects, and the class is Insecta, largest class of Arthropoda, and the order is Lepidoptera. Now, the order of winged insects includes butterflies and moths. There are about 160,000 species of moths in the world and 17,500 species of butterflies. Now, if you look up, uh, look this up on the internet, uh, you're gonna find varying numbers, but probably 19,000, 17,000 around there. There are about 11,000 species of moths in the United States, and there are approximately 750 species of butterflies. So this, this wheel here was used by scientists to help figure out the evolution of butterflies. Now, butterflies, scientists are still in a discovery about the details of Lepidoptera evolution. The most recent DNA and fossil evidence indicates butterflies probably evolved from moths about a hundred million years ago. It's a long time. More than likely originating in Western North America or Central America and or. They develop such colorful wing variations to attract mates and ward off predators. Bees evolved about 120 million years ago and we humans only 750 thousand years ago, okay? So some say we are where we are now because we did not co-evolve with fellow species, thus have not intrinsically, instinctively understood their importance. But we're learning this, part of the reason we are here today. Butterflies and moths, like many other life forms, co-evolved with plants and over millions of years became specialists with certain plant species. An example of this COVID adaptation are hummingbirds with their long tongues that reach into specifically shaped flowers and butterflies that prefer flat flowers to excess nectar, nectar and also their preference for ho certain host plants. So this is a little bit about the anatomy of a butterfly. And you can see the wing veins, the head, the antennae, compound eyes. Sorry, I should be using this. Compound eyes, proboscis, thorax, forelegs, midlegs, hind legs, their abdomen, spiracle, hind wings, wings, and forewings. So that's just a basic look at their anatomy. Not clicking forward. Yeah, clicking on the screen. But... On this screen. Oh, on on that screen. How do I do that? There you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. So right here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, 
So this is the proboscis, the beautiful close-up of the proboscis. And this is a, a very long straw-like apparatus that they use to sip up their nectar. And here's another photo of it. You can see how beautiful that is. And scientists have been spending a lot of time studying it um, to figure out how it works. And, and uh, they, uh, they roll up, it rolls out from a coiled position. So there are about um, 600 species of butterflies that migrate. And this is the Western monarch map the most famous, of course, migrator, migration are the monarchs. The annual migration of North America's monarch butterfly is a unique and amazing phenomenon. The monarch is the only butterfly known to make a two-way migration, so going back and forth, um, as birds do. Unlike other, other butterflies that can overwinter, as larva pupae, or even as adults in some species, monarchs cannot survive the cold with, uh, winters of, of the northern climates. So using environmental cues, the monarchs know when it is time to travel south for the winter. Monarchs use a combination of air currents and thermals to travel long distances, some as far as 3,000 miles wow. to reach their winter havens. Monarchs in eastern North America have a second home in the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico. Monarchs in western North America overwinter in California. So it's too bad that's over that, but what this is, is why the butterflies are important to humans. Pollination is a big one. Like bees, butterflies are important pollinators. As they move from flower to flower in search of nectar, they inadvertently pick up and transfer pollen grains. This cross-pollination is crucial for the fertilization and propagation of many plant species including those that humans depend on for food. We can thank pollinators like butterflies for food, like the fruits and vegetables we eat. They are responsible for one in every three bites of food we consume and contribute over $200 billion to the food economy worldwide. Butterflies are important pollinators as they travel long distances. The pollen attached to their bodies and legs is spread further than that of a honeybee, which stays close to the hive. This benefits plants and the planet as it promotes genetic variation and disease resistance. Bioindicators. Butterflies are considered sensitive bioindicators, meaning the presence, absence, or population trends can tell us a lot about the health of an ecosystem because butterflies are highly sensitive to changes in habitat quality and climate, a decline in butterfly populations can serve as an early warning sign of environmental problems. Areas, areas rich in butterflies and moths are rich in other invertebrates. These collectively provide a wide range of environmental benefits, including pollination and natural pest control. Moths and Butterflies are an important element of the food chain and are prey for birds, bats, and other insectivorous animals. Um, Bluebirds, all the secondary cavity nesters, other than, say, the owls and American catchpots and flickers, are insectivores. Butterflies and moths support a range of other predators and parasites, many of which are specific to individual species or groups of species. Then, Biodiversity. Butterflies contribute to biodiversity both as pollinators and as a food source for other species. Their caterpillars are a primary food source for birds and some insects. A healthy butterfly population can indicate overall biodiversity 
and ecosystem health. Nutrient recycling. Butterfly larvae, caterpillars play a role in nutrient recycling. They consume plant leaves, aiding in the decomposition process and contributing to the nutrient cycle. When they metamorphose, well, metamorphose into butterflies, their discarded pupil cases provide nutrients for the soil. Butterfly and moth caterpillars play a, a role in nutrient recycling because they are uh, because of uh, aiding in the decomposition process, plant growth and evolution. Some butterfly species have co-evolved with specific plant species, leading to mutual benefits. For example, the plant may rely on the butterfly for pollination, while the butterfly relies on the plant as a food source for its larva. This relationship can drive the evolution of both species. Human well-being. The aesthetic value of butterflies also contributes to human well-being. Their beauty encourages people to spend time outdoors, engage with nature, and appreciate biodiversity, which has numerous mental health benefits. And then finally, but not really finally, but you know, my presentation is at this point, education and research. Butterflies, due to their wide variety, availability, and the fascinating process of metamorphosis they undergo, serve as excellent subjects for educational purposes and scientific research. Observing butterflies can provide insights into biological processes like metamorphosis behavior and ecological interactions. However, it's essential to note that butterfly populations are declining globally due to habitat loss, climate change, pollution, and the use of pesticides. The loss of these creatures can have cascading effects on ecosystems and biodiversity, underscoring the need for conservation efforts, which here we are, protecting and restoring butterfly habitats, reducing pesticide use, and planting butterfly-friendly plants can all help to support butterfly populations. So why are butterflies declining? Um, well, one of the biggest reasons is that we don't plant as many California natives as would be beneficial for biodiversity and um, all of our creatures, all of our life forms. And it, it's really interesting to me, and I think to a lot of people, that California is home to nearly 7,000 native plants so many of them are beautiful, and many are endemic. They're only found in California. In fact, we're known as a um, biodiversity hotspot in the world. So what happened? Oh, that's what's happening. Okay, I can't. Oh, did it go? I don't know why. See, I'm pressing this. Am I doing something wrong? Yeah. Uh, you want to go over to here? So it's off the screen. You have two uh, screens, right? Okay, I see. Okay. All right, now I know. Okay, thank you. Yep. So one of the biggest reasons that we didn't start out with California natives and appreciating California natives is because early American settlers from Europe had a Eurocentric view of gardening intended to prefer, prefer European plants over natives. And this approach became entrenched over time. So here's a classic 1950s Cinderella ranch home. And I actually had something that looked very much like this in Pleasant Hill. And um, the, the expansive lawn, the little, the little signature shrubs, these are all reminiscent of aristocracy in England from probably the 1700s, and our forefathers brought this standard with them when they developed, you know, the colonies. And another, um, another uh, uh, development and another reason why we didn't focus on California natives was because 
of trends. And I love ornamental horticulture. Okay, so I'm a person who always loved camellias, proteas, um, banksias. Um, we went through trends where Australian plants were really popular. Thus, we have all those eucalyptus, we've got tons of oleanders, they grow here and they're, they're drought resistant. Same with South African plants. Who doesn't love chameleons and plants from China and other countries? We all love those plants. And then there's habitat fragmentation. So we have butterflies and so many animals need corridors and now they're all chopped up or not all of them, but many of them are. So they can't, they can't really travel the way they used to, the way they evolved to. And of course, then the neonicotinoids, um, they've, they've uh, been so damaging to bees, to all of our pollinators for that matter. And there are fewer nesting sites, uh, fewer host plants. Um, these are uh, native bees, uh, same thing happened to them. And pathogens, parasites, poor nutrition, and just not enough food. And climate change. This is a big one. Um, working with uh, secondary cavity misters as long as I have, you know, we battle, we're battling now climate change. And uh, the California Bluebird Recovery Program reports annually over 16,000 successful pledges in California. And uh, we're, we're proud of that. Is that really going to save the, this, this niche of birds? We don't know. But what we're doing is we're giving them time. We're giving them time to evolve and adapt. That may be all we can do, but that's what we're doing. And I feel it's the same with butterflies and all the others. So what can we do to help them? Okay, so you're all familiar with Doug Ptolemy. Not everybody. Well, Doug Ptolemy, um, who is a uh, entomology uh, professor um, at, in, uh, on the East Coast, uh, the University of Delaware, offered uh, strategies to uh, promote biodiversity in a very simple way, plant natives in your backyard. That's it, really. And planting natives um, instead of this, which is very pretty and peaceful and aesthetically nice, go with this. How about this? This is a front yard. This is my front yard uh, in Pleasant Hill. My neighbors hated me, by the way, because there was. It was, it was back in the 90s, and uh, it was during the, the trend of Rosalind Creasy. Anybody remember her? Okay, well, you know, I was a follower of hers. But I sure had a lot of butterflies, bees, and um, other uh, creatures in my yard. So here's your classic lawn, and then here is a... Uh, lawn that was removed, and this was um, on uh, this, I believe this was in Clayton, and this was on the Bringing Back the Nature's Tour. And then also planting natives and wildflowers on roadsides, medians, and then you have your school project. Um, you know, it really makes a difference. Plant them in parks. This is uh, the Moraga. Uh, Garden Club, and uh, they have a demonstration garden in a park in Moraga. And then the other thing uh, that is really difficult is light pollution. So if you don't need the light, just turn it off. Because um, moths, in particular, since they're nocturnal, are very disoriented by night lights. Like the old saying, um, you know, moth to a flame. It's really not moth to a flame. It's more like moth going crazy because of light. It disorients them. They get they get confused. They're used to following the stars and the moon, and and so artificial lights are very very damaging to them. So, what components make up a habitat? Now, this was 
One of the elements of study that I really focused on when I was uh, studying horticulture formally, um, because I wanted to understand the components of habitat and as they relate to each species that I was interested in. And of course we have food. Okay, so this is non-native food, cosmos and zinnias, which by the way, Al Shapiro, who is a, a very, a very well-known uh, butterfly expert at UC Davis, um, people at Annie's Annuals, probably you're going to you're going to meet posse pollinator. Um, they they don't necessarily promote 100% natives. Uh, doc, Dr. Gordon Frankie, bee expert, uh, Urban Bee Lab in Berkeley, they they probably go 60, 40, 70, 30 like that. And uh, I know Gordon Frankie uh, included Cosmos and Zinnia on uh, their urban bee list. And then the native plants, Sedalsia, Malaflora, and Erigeron, Umulatum. I did not use botanical names for all the plants because sometimes there is just too much. But uh, this is buckwheat. And this is, this is a form of mallow. And then, uh, Host plants, uh, skippers like the Lemus glaucus, and of course the monarch on narrow leaf uh, milkweed. And then, uh, so that's uh, food and water and uh, mud puddles. Um, all the butterflies really need mud puddles, little shallow pans of water um, and cover. And these are native uh, examples of good cover, toyon which is a um, um, heteromeles or beautifolia, which is a uh, like a keystone in, in the habitat because it provides something for uh, something each season. Okay, so here's Calscape. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Calscape, it's an absolutely wonderful tool online that is free and it's being updated by the way. And so I put in here, Calscape, I put in El Cerrito, El Cerrito, and it came up with 800, 800 native plants to El Cerrito, California. And each one, you can see they're in categories, you can go through and look at them all. And then I went into butterflies and put in El Cerrito, and you have 325 butterflies and moths, indigenous to your town. That's a lot, All right? Did any of you know that? Yeah, it's a lot. And you can go and look at each butterfly if you want, and guess what? you can find their host plants. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. And it's really, it's, it's one of the most valuable uh, tools that I've, I've used or had. And then you can find, they have a garden planner. You can create your plant list. And then you can also find nurseries. And like I said, they're updating it. So about three years ago, I'm a member of the Rossmore Garden Club, and I retired about three years ago, and I didn't really have time to get that involved with the Garden Club. And the Rossmore Garden Community Garden is on five acres. We have about 125 uh, lots. I have a very large lot, and I was wondering how come we don't have that many butterflies? And so um, I asked if I could give a presentation on butterflies. And so uh, the, uh, the garden club took it very seriously as we garden clubbers do. And so a lot of the gardeners started planting butterfly plants. Okay. And so in 2023, now 2022, we didn't see very many species of butterflies at all. Definitely no monarchs. But in 2023, these are what we saw. And I, I took all these pictures. Painted lady. Well, gardeners planted hollyhocks. And hollyhocks are a host plant for the painted lady. 
And they also have native uh, native ones, but the hollyhock is, is. And of course, we know our little sweet little cabbage white and brassicas. So uh, for us vegetable gardeners, and I am a vegetable gardener, by the way, um, orange sulfur, legumes, they like in the Fabaceae family. So in the legumes would all, all would also be lupins. Fiery skipper, grasses. California buckeye. Of course, Aeschylus californica, um, which is the uh, buckeye tree. And then I was really proud of this one. We got monarchs. And it wasn't because they had host plants. It was because we had nectar for them. And this is one of the uh, best butterfly plants I've ever had. And it is not a native. It's Mexican sunflower tithonia. And I gave you guys some in a little packet. You're welcome to come and get some more seed heads here. I hope they grow if they don't. Just go ahead and order some tithonia seeds, but these these will pop. You know, good. It's very possible they'll grow. The best native milk milkweed, a lot of you already know, are narrow leaf, California, and showy. And let's not forget our little moths. This is a western tussock moth. Now look at that little face. <laughs> And, and we really need to pay more attention to moths. And that little guy's um, host planter buckwheats, erigerons, and python swallowtail. Now, again, this is not a native, this is a lilac, and it is in Alkite's yard in Moraga, and its host plant is Dutchman's Pipe. And Joyce said that she has some that uh, she can donate, I would grab them. This gentleman is Jim Spinello, and he's in the Rossmore Community Garden here. He is a, um, a pipeline and swallowtail expert, I would say. In fact, he's established colonies all over Contra Costa County and uh, Ruth Bancroft Garden. Have any of you been to Ruth Bancroft? Okay. Well, in the back of the garden, he has an established colony of uh, uh, pipevine swallowtail butterflies on Aristolochia californica, which is the Dutchman's pipe. And here he's measuring with me because we're going to, uh, he's going to help us to start uh, a butterfly garden for them. Here's his uh, version of Aristolochia californica. And as you can see, it's upright. The plant needs to be upright. Uh, it will not bloom if it's not upright. Okay, so, and here's the Dutchman's pipe flower. And they uh, only come out in the winter time. The uh, Dutchman's pipe vine is deciduous. So it has something beautiful to look at every year. I mean, every, time, every season of the year. So here are the eggs, and uh, the eggs take about eight days to hatch. And here are the newbies, and they uh, eat their shells for energy. And uh, the caterpillars grow very fast and shed their skin five or six times. We call those instars. And uh, they eat the leaves of their host plant recycling. For three to four weeks, and I mean, they devour them. So, like when you're planting milkweed or aristolochia, any host plant, you want to plant enough to where you can, you know, feel confident your caterpillars will have enough food to eat. Um, so, this one is uh, uh, about ready to form a chrysalis. And at this point, uh, they will expel their entire digestive system. And here you go, she's beginning to anchor herself and uh, make her chrysalis. This takes about three days or so. And um, 
there is a uh, chrysalis, and the chrysalis is a chameleon. A lot of people don't know this. This is something that Jim Spinello pointed out to me. There's a green one. I thought you were brown. And they become the color of their environment. And birth is not easy. And there she goes. She's struggling here. There she is with her wings. And Jim leaves, left them watermelon so they can hydrate themselves with watermelon. So now we go into the monarch. And I know you guys are probably very familiar with monarchs because you know they are a very popular species and we all grew up with them in that. Um, of course, you start with A. Caterpillar, chrysalis, and then the final, final adult. And the Western monarch uh, migration, I did talk a little bit about migration. Um, monarchs in North America undertake a remarkable migration, traveling thousands of miles between their breeding grounds. Decreasing day length and temperatures along with aging milkweed and other nectar sources trigger the birth of the super generation in their epic migration. They live eight times longer than their parents and grandparents, up to eight months, and travel 10 times farther. Unlike most other insects in temperate climates, monarch butterflies cannot survive a long cold winter. Instead, they spend the winter in roosting spots. Monarchs west of the Rocky Mountains travel to small groves of trees along the California coast. One tagged butterfly was recently reported on Journey North to have traveled 265 miles in just one day. Recent flight studies results posted on Journey North revealed that a monarch with 140 milligrams of fat to burn could fly for 44 hours when flapping but 160, 1,060 hours when soaring and gliding. Yeah, they're strong little guys. Congregating on the branches of eucalyptus, Monterey pine, Monterey, Monterey cypress, and western sycamore, monarch butterflies cluster in colonies to stay warm. Between February and March, the western monarch population situated west of the Rocky Mountains departs from their overwintering sites along the California coast. They then travel inland, inland in search of habitat rich with milkweed to lay their eggs. Many butterflies rely on a single plant species or multiple species in the same genus as a food source for their larval stage, with larvae typically eating plant parts, for example, leaves, flowers, buds. This type of plant is called a host plant. Milkweed is the host plant for monarchs. The larvae eat milkweed, and without milkweed, the larva would not be able to develop into a butterfly. The adult monarch and monarch larvae are both brightly colored, serving as a warning to potential predators that they are poisonous. Unsuspecting predators only need to taste a monarch butterfly or larva once to learn not to eat them again. Most animals quickly spit them out. Resident populations. It may be surprising to learn that not all northern not all North American monarch butterflies migrate. Resident populations of monarchs remain in the same location for their entire life cycle. The science surrounding the existence of resident monarchs continues to evolve. The Circe Society lists um, 15 different native milkweeds to California, but recommends that narrow leaf milkweed, Asclepsias fascicularis, showy milkweed, Asclepsia speciosa, and California milkweed, Asclepsias californica, as the best species to plant due to their ability to grow in the widest range of conditions and the opportunity to buy them commercially. So to see them roosting in the Bay Area, and you 
probably already know this, but Arden one is a really good. Um, there were quite a few there this year. The Monarch Grove Sanctuary and Pacific Grove, of course. Coyote Hills in Fremont, another good one. I was uh, there last, just last year. And then of course, uh, Natural Bridges State Beach in Santa Cruz. So we're very lucky we have these roosting sites here on the coast, not that far from us. Um, butterflies like masses of flowers. So if you have the space, try to plant three or more of the same species, not just one. Research and plant flowers that will bloom in, bloom in each season. Now this is a little uh, sidebar of Al Kite's backyard garden. And you can see he has colors that follow through in this little path area. And he does this throughout his garden where he has um, these patterns, but the, it's not just one specimen. This is a, a buckwheat here. I think there's a buckwheat over here. So buckwheats are one of the best plants for perennials for butterflies. And here is one here, Areogonum nudum, Ella Nelson's yellow. And they come in different colors. You can get rust color, you can get red, you can get kind of a pink, you can get white. Uh, Verbena lilacina de la Mina um, attracted 17 different species of butterflies in Al Kite's garden. And I have a list of his plants okay, that I gave you so you can examine those. Of course, California poppies. Seaside daisy. This is a, a specimen that I have in a container in my garden. I really like it. It has a long lasting bloom. You just pinch off the, the heads and, and it'll keep blooming, it seems like, for months. And then here's a, a layered effect that you see in nature. We don't see that as much in our, in our gardens, in our backyards, but this is this is like a natural look. This is uh, in Al Kite's garden, and this would be a, uh, something very valuable in the spring. See a note of this uh, poppies and buckwheat. And then of course yarrow, marigolds. Lilac, who doesn't love lilac? And lilac actually grows here, so we're lucky. And buddleia, I was surprised when I went to Pacific Grove how many buddleia they have there. Um, so buddleia davidii, and they can get big and you do have to put them back in the fall, but um, they are a magnet. And this is, uh, do you, does everybody know what this little guy is? Sweet. Yes, hawk moth. It's a hawk moth. They look they look like a hummingbird. You can confuse them with a hummingbird because they're almost as big as a hummingbird. And they were prolific last year. We had like seemed like we had a population explosion of them. Horse cosmos, it's one of my favorite garden flowers. Zinnias. And try to stick with. Try to not focus on hybrids because uh, they, they just, they don't provide the pollen and, and the nectar that the true forms do. Of course, California asters, this is in my garden, I think. I have it in a container. Sunflowers, of course. And then my one of my favorite plants to attract bees and butterflies is Tithonia, which is the Mexican sunflower. I gave you packets, but please come up here and take more of these seed heads, okay? Uh, let's see, and so planting natives, uh, the best time to plant natives is after it rains. That way you don't have to water them once a week until they get established. And this is a, a man that helps me periodically We're in the Rossmore garden and we're working on a native garden here. He's digging up the soil. If it's good, rich California soil, you don't have to amend it. You just make sure the drainage is good, dig your hole. We have gophers, so we do use gopher baskets. And sometimes I make my own gopher baskets because they're less expensive to part with cloth. I did that for my fruit trees, so. Pot band. 
and you just tease it out, tease it out. You guys know this, so I know. And this is the grass. Um, I think I planted 20 of these wild blue rye, the Leonis glauca, which is a skipper post plant, and also a couple of moths. And then you just water, water good. It had rained, so I didn't have to water that much. And then I mulched, you see, with uh, with oak leaves. This is a manzanita. This is a native over here. Essentially, these are there's four four beds, and we're replanting them because it was a failed uh, native garden, so it's being restored. And then you, you can see how long it is. It's pretty long. And then here's here's the, the grasses. That's me. And uh, does does anybody here see bluebirds in uh, El Cerrito? I mean, okay, okay. Well, this is it was taken um, in El Cerrito, and uh, one of your residents actually uh, has it. She's a great example of someone who um, has contributed to a conservation effort pretty much by herself. And she has a flock of these birds in her neighborhood. And uh, here she's supplementing their diet with mealworms through the, through the winter. Um, but um, I do give a presentation on bluebirds, so if you'd be interested, you know, maybe next year we could do that. And I'd like to thank you for planting butterfly plants. And my cats <laughs> say, yeah, yeah. adios. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's Hermie. Hermie is the white one. Reina is the tabby. And they are rescue cats. They were dumped uh, at a barn uh, in Livermore. So my husband and I rescued them. So. So thank you very, very much. Hope you enjoyed it. We picked up a few things. So um, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgia. And um, don't forget that there's some books up here you could look at and Georgia's wonderful offering of more seed